They're live. Here we go. Look at that. We're live. Calling Chris yeah. Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London. Calling Rick Byer in Chicago. No, no. No! No, not in Chicago. Where are you, Rick? I am at the National D-Day Memorial in Bedford, Virginia, where I was wow. a speaker today, and uh, we'll show a little bit later on some of the... Uh, the uh, ceremonies that took place here in uh, Bedford, Virginia. And, and and Chris, as we're getting ready, of course, we want to welcome everybody to History Happy Hour. Yes. Uh, and we're here every Sunday talking about history. We, we usually uh, kind of warm up for a few moments to make sure that people uh, have joined us and are, are ready to be here. And our show comes to you with the support and assistance of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Uh, yes. And uh, Chris, one of our viewers actually came down and uh, visited with me yesterday. Really? Somebody that you know, I think, uh, Ted hey. Moon. So there's yep. Ted Moon, and there's the inflatable tank. Yes, the inflatable yes. tank is here at the D-Day Memorial this week. You told me you were going to pick it up and hold it over your head, though. You know, I didn't. Uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, even an inflatable tank is too too much for me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's kind of tough there. But... Um, uh, we have a, a, a big D-Day show planned for you guys, and uh, we, uh, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, but we hope to solve them all. And I uh, have on Giles Milton, author Giles Milton, and then later on in the show have on uh, uh, historians Joe Balkoski and Craig Simons. And uh, um, we hope to uh, really have a great conversation and bring in a lot of people to talk about D-Day, because w what day is this, Chris? Uh, it's the 77th anniversary of D-Day. 77th anniversary of D-Day. I looked at the got, calendar. Who have we got joining us? Uh, well, Ted made it back from Bedford, so that's good. Or at least he's watching remotely. Uh, George Laws, Neil, who's forgiven me for all those things I said about um, fighter pilots from last week. And uh, Lizzie Borden from London, Gene Templin. So... And I saw that Marcus had joined earlier, so we can, you know, officially start. Uh, Brian Peacock. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And so um, I also want to just shout out two other viewers of our show, um, uh, uh, Bonnie and Tom Eyestone, who also came from Ohio uh, wow. to come to the ceremonies here and to say hi and express their appreciation for History Happy Hour. So we're glad to be uh, with a lot of people that way. So, Chris, I think, have we killed enough time to be able to I get to so. our, our open? Can I have the drum roll, please? Brrr. I don't have the bell with me, so I just have to go. No. Bing! And the bar is open. The bar is open. Um, our our D-Day show, I am live from the National D-Day Memorial, and I thought, therefore, that we would um, start with um, some video from today's ceremonies at the National D-Day Memorial honoring uh, those who fought on D-Day. So I'm going to roll that uh, and give you a chance to look at that, and uh, then we'll come back. to welcome each of you to the memorial on the 77th anniversary of the Allied landing in Normandy. At the west end of Omaha Beach, a squat German bunker faces down the long strip of sand. Today, it is a monument to the National Guard. On June 6, 1944, that bunker spewed fire and death, ending the life of many a young man of infinite promise who had arrived on the beach only moments before, including Taylor Fellers and Company A from Bedford. And it is our privilege on this day to be joined by a distinguished body of men who belonged to the Allied Expeditionary Force that invaded occupied France 77 years ago, 
and I want to address my words here to them, and they're in different places, but I see, I see Ash back here. I see Louis out there. You are seated here today at this magnificent memorial to the valor, fidelity, and sacrifice that you displayed with such abundance while doing what you believe to be nothing more or less than your duty. church bell tolled non-stop. The citizens lined both sides of the road, waving and cheering as one. Their reaction was spontaneous, explosion of energy, joy and tears. Our convoy paused. We were spellbound and overcome with this generous reception. With the sight of our massive convoy approaching, they realized they were indeed liberated. It was an amazing day. Yeah, it looks like it was. I wish I could have been there. I know you had to share some D-Day thoughts. Well, yeah, it's just, um, obviously it's been a rough couple of years for a lot of folks. Uh, and this, I, I've always been in Normandy on the 6th, and so uh, I'm missing it a lot, and I'm thinking a little bit about um, all the guys I knew. And um, back in the day, when a lot more of the Easy Company guys were alive, uh, they would all call everybody on the 5th of June and talk about, well, this is when we were getting into the planes. Um, and I think about the guys, Paul Rogers in particular, that would always call me um, and just talk about the night. And this is me uh, on an earlier trip, I think probably about 27, 2007, 2008, uh, in Normandy with uh, Don Malarkey on the left and Buck Compton on the right. So um, we have a lot to talk about, but I think about my friends today. So, As you should, as you yeah. should. And I think, you know, what... what uh, what so many speakers said today is, you know, it's really important for us to remember this and keep remembering this. Agreed. Um, Agreed. And one person who's uh, uh, really doing a great job at remembering this, Chris, is our next guest. Tell us a little bit yeah. about him. Uh, Giles Milton. Giles is a very, very popular uh, writer of uh, narrative history. So for those who uh, don't know what that means, that means really good history that's very readable. Uh, so, <laughs> so we appreciate that. Yeah, uh, but he's the author of uh, more than a dozen books, mostly of history. Um, I first uh, got interested in, in what he's written about because he covers a wide range of topics. Uh, but he wrote a wonderful book called Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, uh, which deals with the special operations executive, which, as you know, uh, is something that I've become quite interested in. Uh, but very recently, um, he's also written a book. Uh, it has two titles, depending on where you are in the world. Here in, in Britain, it's called D-Day, The Soldier's Story. Uh, but in the States, it's just come out in paperback, and it's called Soldier, Sailor, Frogman, Spy. Oh, there you go. Much better. Um, which is a wonderful uh, history of the first 24 hours of D-Day, uh, and it has some wonderful uh, first-person accounts. So it's something I would really encourage you to, to have a look at. So, And here's the man who put it all together. Giles, welcome Giles. to Mystery Happy Hour. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I hope the connection's going to uh, going to last a duration here because uh, there's a lot to talk about. Yes, we're, we're, exactly. Yeah, and we're we're having we've had some we've had some connection issues with Giles, so we told him that we were just going to muddy through. I think uh, what was it that Eisenhower said, Chris? Uh, uh, once, no once plan the survives. Begins. Yes, no all plan plans survives survive first contact. Yeah. Yes. So, Giles, did you bring a cocktail? Because that will always help you get through history happy hour. Uh, 
He's reaching. I gotta go. Excellent. Excellent. Very English. Very good. Yes. And I have uh, a local beer here, a Vienna Lager. So uh, from here in Virginia, and Chris has a big bottle of something. Well, yeah, I have a Brewdog, which is uh, actually started in Scotland, but I got an extra large bottle because it's an extra long show this week. See, so. But moving on to the history, which I think is why we're all here. Yeah, finally. So, so Giles, um, really enjoyed the book, and I, I loved what you did with all the narrative accounts and, and some, some first-person accounts I'd never read before. But just to start off, what kind of got you to the point where you said, I'm going to write a book about D-Day? I mean, it's, it's a pretty crowded field. There's a lot that's been written about it. What did you want to say or what did you think needed to be said about D-Day? Yeah, I suppose uh, from my point of view, a lot of the stories of D-Day, both uh, British, American, Canadian, have been told from the commander's point of view, from the officer class. So this is particularly the case in my own country. And what I want to do is go back to the stories of the, the young conscripts, uh, teenagers, often absolutely terrified, they'd never been in combat before, who were going to land on the beaches on the 6th of June uh, in 1944 and tell their stories of what it was like to be in the in the front right line of combat, you know. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to ju not just tell the stories of the Americans and the Brits, and obviously many, many American histories of D-Day talk about D-Day as if it was an entirely American operation, um, ignoring the fact that it was, uh, while there were 73,000 US troops involved, there were also 62,000 UK troops involved. So I wanted to tell the story of, the, of all the different allied forces involved, Canadians as well, Polish, French. But I also wanted to tell the story from the German point of view, which has been much less told. What was it like for the Germans who were in the front line of defending those beaches on D-Day? An absolutely fascinating story because many of these soldiers were also teenage conscripts who didn't want to be there. So their story was one I wanted to tell. And, and lastly, I wanted to tell the story which is really never heard at all, is the voices of the French civilians who lived on the coast of Normandy. You know, this, for many of your, you know, the viewers tonight might have been to Normandy, they'll know that this coastline is, is lined with villages and, uh, and inhabitants and farms and uh, what have you. And what was it like for the French who were to find themselves under the heaviest naval bombardment in the history of warfare. Their voice had not been, their stories had not been told. So I wanted to include these in my book as well. So when you, uh, so in a certain sense, when I've been describing your book to people and, and uh, don't cringe too much here, it reminds me of Cornelius Ryan's book, The Longest Day. Uh, and, and I know you had some, you had access to his uh, notes and, and archives, which was pretty amazing. Um, and, and and yet, how how would you say that it's it's different from that? Is there a lot more material you think that's available to you now, or is it just that because you wanted to be have sort of that same broad idea, but with a much wider uh, you know net that you captured more material? Well, that's an interesting question because, of, as you say, I did go to the Cornelius Ryan uh, archive, and of course, the longest day is actually a very short book, and he interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people and this these interviews were never used in his final book so i included a lot of stuff that cornelius ryan had not used but also he used he his he, he used a very limited number of sources for the german material and and very few of the french uh, inhabitants of that coastline so i, I hoped um and also there was a, there's a tendency in his book and i, I in no way want to book his uh, knock his book because it's an absolute marvelous history of the day of the longest day oh but if you can create some controversy on our show <laughs> you know, that's that's good that's good we can get in the headlines tomorrow let's do it the, there's a but coming <laughs> but but what I felt um, had not been told was the, the kind of raw, unvarnished stories of the, of the young teenage conscripts. You know, their voices, certainly in everything I read about uh, D-Day, had not been told very much. And often, certainly in Britain, the, it was the officer class who were able to write their stories and get them published uh, after D-Day. So the, the sort of traditional stories that I've grown up on and indeed have been hand, passed down through Hollywood are the ones that have... Uh, 
have been told by the officer class. And I'll give you an example. There's a famous story, which we love in Britain, of Lord Lovett landing on uh, Sword Beach with the commandos, uh, landing with you know, his bagpipe player playing the bagpipes. And uh, it's a great story of heroism. But what, uh, and Lord Lovett, um, his story is, is, is incorporated directly into the Hollywood movie, The Longest Day. Who was the historical consultant for The Longest Day? It was none other than Lord Lovett. So, of course, he put himself directly into the movie and he wrote out many of the young conscripts who were fighting under him. And there was this, this great story that they were all racing to get to Pegasus Bridge. The great goal for the British on D-Day was to get to Pegasus Bridge and rescue the airborne forces that had landed in the night. Lord Lovett tells the story of how he got there first. Actually, no, it wasn't quite like that. There was a bunch of young teenagers, really uh, tough, hardened fighters, who got there quite a few, quite a few hours before Lord Lovett. And their story didn't get a look in. They were, it was never mentioned. So they were pretty unhappy about this. And so in my book, I hopefully could restore the stories of some of the incredibly heroic young teenagers who, who did great things and performed wonderful deeds on D-Day. So, yes, and so, Charles, when you're uncovering the stories of, of these teenagers and these conscripts, again, very young men, but is there anything that surprised you, anything that you discovered as you're doing the research, like, wow, because, I mean, so much is already known about D-Day. Um, as you were diving into these, the story from this perspective, was there anything that surprised you? I think what was really interesting is that the planning for D-Day had obviously uh, been going on for months and months and months. It was the most meticulously planned military operation in history. Every single beach, every, every minute of every beach was planned of how it was going to unfold. But of course, as we all know, you know, as soon as the fighting starts, everything begins to go wrong. Uh, uh, troops don't land where they're meant to land. Uh, the, the, the fighting doesn't unfold as it is supposed to unfold. The bombers who are bombing the beaches don't, they drop their bombs in the wrong places. And what I found and what has not really, I felt, been told before is that what, what happened is that, um, there was a reliance on individual soldiers to take the initiative on the morning as they landed on the beaches. Many of these soldiers who'd never been in combat before had to take the initiative, land a small, you know, lead a small band of men onto the beaches and and take out individual German strong points. And it came became apparent to me that it was the individual heroism of small groups of men who really turned the tide in those opening hours of D-Day and really changed, changed uh, the whole course of the day's fighting. So, um, so for example, on, on Omaha Beach, one of the American beaches, you know, we have young men at one particularly one of just plucking one name out of a hat. Jack Ellery, young, a young fighter, goes on to, uh, to Omaha Beach and manages to lead a small group of men to attack a German bunker, knock it out. And by knocking out a German bun bunker, you end up um, enabling troops to land on a stretch of beach, which is now more or less safe. So I wanted to focus on these um, men who performed great acts of hero heroism on D-Day and enabled troops behind in the second, third, fourth waves to come ashore, not under heavy gunfire. But more than that, that's one aspect. The other thing I want to do is tell the story of the Germans who were firing at them. So in, in the story of the Americans landing on Omaha, as the American troops are landing under terrible, withering gunfire, I also have the accounts of young German conscripts in their bunkers firing onto the Americans. And this creates an incredible sort of narrative drama, really to try and bring out the drama, the horror and the terror of what it was like both to land uh, to land and, and come under this heavy German gunfire. And then I know you've uh, you've obviously traveled and been uh, to all the D-Day beaches and to stand there, as I think some of the people in our audience know, at, say, uh, Widerstand 62, uh, and look down the beach from that height and imagine uh, that firepower there. It, it, is, it, is, it is almost impossible to imagine how anyone can survive it and, and the emotions of the people who are, who are delivering that firepower on you know, uh, young men not unlike themselves stumbling across the beach. That's right. And that particular strong point, I mean, there was one soldier that some viewers might be familiar with called Franz Gockel, young teenager. 
he was absolutely terrified. He was in. He was uh, to defend the beach. He was to shoot down, gun down, basically all the troops who were landing, uh, with a small group of men. And um, uh, you know, it was fascinating to read the accounts, which I hadn't really read before, and I'm sure a lot of people haven't, of of what it was like for these. Uh, you know, they like the Americans and Brits landing. They were 17 years old, 18 years old. To, to when dawn broke on the 6th of, uh, of June, 1944, they look out of their strong point and they see the biggest armada in history that's coming towards them. And they know that only one side is gonna win this battle. And, and the, 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 there's accounts of Gok Franz Gockel and, and another chap, Carl Wegner, who was at the other end of Omaha Beach. The, the sort of terror of these young lads and then the, the horror of gunning down, and they were just watching, uh, they, were, they were committing a massacre. They, the, the Americans were landing onto, you know, on, into a complete nightmare scenario. They didn't stand a chance, a lot of these young American lads, uh, and they were being gunned down. So to give the, those two perspectives, um, I, I felt sort of when I wrote my book, you know, 75 years on, it was time, I think, that there's, there's a distance of time um, to be able to tell both sides of the story and that, that of course, in the uh, German uh, German defense, there were some hardened Nazis who would do any, absolutely anything uh, to defend the shore of Normandy. But there were others, other Germans, who were as terrified as the Brits, the Canadians and the, and the Americans who were coming ashore that morning. Now, so, Jess, one of the things that I'd like to get your perspective on is kind of how Britain remembers or, or deals with the day. So growing up in the States as a young man, D-Day is central to our World War II story. I mean, everybody, every kid plays about, plays soldiers. They know about it. it it's there. The movies, everything. Um, when I was younger, I would travel to Britain a lot in the 70s, 80s. Uh, and they'd always talk about the Battle of Britain. They'd talk about the war in the desert. And they'd mention D-Day, but it wasn't didn't seem quite as central. Um, and it's only just, well, today that there's now a memorial, large memorial that's been dedicated uh, over Gold Beach. Why do you think it took so long here in Britain for, for the story to become as big as it is now? I mean, it seems to like they had to catch up. It's true that it's kind of weird in Britain that 1940, Dunkirk, which is when huge numbers of 330,000 British troops had to be evacuated from uh, the continent back to Britain, that bizarrely is seen as the great moment in, in Britain's Second World War, oh. which is kind of weird given that it was a great disaster. But we've, yeah. dressed it, we've dressed it up as a great victory. I think what's fascinating about D-Day is this is really the last time in the Second World War that Britain is able to fight on a parity with the, with the almost on a parity with the US. Like I said, the US on D-Day itself was going to field 73,000 troops and, and Britain was going to field 62,000 troops. This was a joined up operation. Um, and, uh, and I think what's interesting is also uh, what many Americans don't realize and what many Brits don't realize is that there was a lot of crossover between the, uh, you know, in the fighting on that day. So one of the first uh, companies of American troops to land on uh, Omaha Beach on the morning of the 6th of June, which was a company uh, landing on the western end of Omaha Beach, they were actually led ashore by a, an English Royal Navy uh, naval pilot. Uh, and, and likewise, on, on, in other places, on, on Utah Beach, uh, there were Brits involved in the operation. There were Americans involved on the British beaches. So um, it's, it's, when you read history books, you get very much the sense that, oh, the Americans were on uh, uh, Utah and Omaha. The Brits were on, if the, if the Brits are mentioned at all, they were on sword and gold. And maybe, you know, we might mention the Canadians on Juno. It was much more complex than that yeah. and, and much more of a joined up operation. And of course, you know, the... The, on the American beach is one of the big uh, important innovations with the use of uh, amphibious tanks, which have been wholly developed uh, in Britain as well, which they didn't work very well on Omaha, but they were a lifesaver on uh, Utah, on gold and on sword beaches. Yeah. Well, I was just gonna, I was really just gonna throw in that you mentioned Company A and I, I of course, I am in Bedford, Virginia right now. Mm. So this mm. is where the, the Bedford boys were from uh, I mentioned Taylor Fellers, who you write about in the book, um, uh, and the conversation, uh, it's a heart, heartbreaking moment, the conversations between him and the, the British coxswain of the boat and, the, and, and trying to, to figure out what's going to happen. And it seems like it's going to be 
uh, fine, and then it's not. And of course, Joe Belkowski, who's joining us later, has also done tremendous amounts of research uh, into that. I, I wanted to ask, Chris, did you have a follow-up to that? Because my question can come later. No, I just no, wanted to ahead. make that go Bedford ahead. comment, but you could go if you had something. No. That, okay. Well, I, I just wanted to ask, you've alluded to this twice, uh, and, and I think you're absolutely right. Americans, uh, we know y Utah Beach, where Henry Fonda won, mm. and, and uh, uh, <laughs> Omaha Beach, where Robert Mitchum took the day. And, uh, and we might remember that the British were there, and we don't, we don't really know what they did, and we forget that the Canadians were there entirely, even exactly. though, as Chris points out, they saved the day. Okay. So, but what I would ask you, what, what are we missing? Give us a couple of stories, and I don't know, maybe um, uh, Stanley Hollis or somebody like that, the Dalton brothers. You tell some great stories about what happened, about figures that Americans just don't know anything about. Can you kind of, can you unravel a couple of those? Yeah, let, let me be, begin with one of the, the first uh, stories, really, that begins on D-Day. In fact, just before the beginning of the 6th of June, in the night of the 5th and 6th of June, there were two bridges that it was absolutely critical uh, to be captured at the beginning, uh, before the troops landed on the shore. And this was the operation to capture the Benneville and Ranville bridges uh, over the canal and the river. Sure. Uh, they would later, one of the bridges would later become famous as Pegasus, Pegasus Bridge. Now, why was it important to capture these bridges? If they didn't, the real fear was that the German panzer divisions could swoop across these bridges into the beachhead and just attack the uh, newly landed troops, you know, seasick, uh, uh, terrified, uh, just landed ashore. They would be uh, very, very vulnerable to attack by German panzer division. So it was critical that these bridges should be captured. And what the British launched uh, in that, that night was a brilliant coup de main operation to capture these bridges. A small number of men landed by glider. Unbelievably, they managed to land these gliders. Uh, you know, these are, these are, these are planes without any engines you know they land them right next to the bridges the guy get the guys get out they run across to the bridges they hurl absolutely everything they have at it grenades machine guns everything they've got and they capture these bridges in a very short space of time and this is a critical uh strategic you know operation at the beginning of d-day by doing that they have ensured that the german panzers are not going to be able to get into the allied beachhead at the beginning of D-Day. So it's small things like that, which, to ha which were to have huge repercussions in a good way for the Allies who are about to land on the beaches. So, and I'm gonna to add to this, Giles, since I'm yeah. gonna bring in your other book and it's gonna help me with what I'm trying to do later. But- yeah. <laughs> Ulterior motives. Ulterior so. motives, me, no. Um, you wrote uh, in, uh, Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare uh, about the Special Operations Executive uh, and some of the things that they got up to. Another wonderful book. Um, but maybe you could kind of tease a little bit. What was going on with SOE and some of the other special operations prior to D-Day to kind of get ready for the invasion? Yeah, great, great question. Now, in 1994, I was sent over to Normandy to interview some of the uh, the French who were on that coastline, uh, you know, in 1944. And one of them I met was this chap called Guillaume Mercador. Guillaume Mercador was this wonderfully dapper little French chap. And he invited me into his home and we drank, uh, drank tea in his library. And he told me about his what he was doing in the run up to D-Day. He was a champion cyclist. And he... Um, the, the, the coastal road along the north coast of Normandy, absolutely vital coastal road, was obviously out of bounds. The Germans have said no Frenchman was allowed to go along this road because it was where all their defences were. But Guillaume Mercader was an absolutely charming individual, charmed the local Gestapo chief, who, who allowed him to continue training on his bicycle up and down the coastline. What the Gestapo did not realize is that Guillaume Mercadeur was gathering military intelligence on every strong point, every bunker, every machine gun nest that was being installed on that coastline. He was then reporting it back to his local uh, French resistance network, who were then reporting it back to SOE in London. Within 24 hours of Guillaume Mercadeur cycling along the coast of Normandy, General Eisenhower had that information on his desk. So Eisenhower and, you know, the uh, Allied headquarters who are planning D-Day, are planning right up to the last minute. They had absolutely detailed military intelligence 
of what was taking place, German troop movements, where poles had been stuck into fields to stop gliders landing, absolutely everything. Troops being moved up to the coast on the railway network. Um, and so men like Guillaume Mercador, and there were many of them, working for SOE, uh, Special uh, Operations Executive, supplied incredible amounts of, of military intelligence to, uh, to Schaeff uh, planning the landings in, in, in England. So, uh, Giles, were there any stories that you um, uh, had hoped to dive into where you felt like it was hard to find the material or you couldn't find the material? Um, or, or conversely, uh, stories that, that sort of, uh, when you started to dig in, you couldn't believe that there was material on it there. Yeah, I think one of the things I dug up in one of the archives here in London was um, an, a, a, an unpublished diary of a young commando uh, in his very early 20s who went ashore on Sword Beach uh, with Lord Lovett, uh, this great sort of triumphant landing on Sword Beach. Um, what his diary uh, really told about D-Day was how it was unvarnished, raw, absolutely what it was like. First and, first and foremost, to cross the English Channel that night. Now, many listeners, uh, w uh, people watching tonight will know that the weather was pretty awful. And the English Channel, even in midsummer, can be a terrible place to be. And Cliff Morris sets out, you know, as they left the shores of England, they were all fed this huge meal of beef stew, cups of tea, tons of chocolate, unlimited food. They never had so much food, you know, in the previous few months. Well, boy, did they regret that within a few, within a couple of hours of getting into the English Channel. It was terrible in the Channel that night. It was unbelievably rough. They were all vomiting. They were seasick. Um, they they were they took seasick, uh, seasickness pills, which gave them terrible headaches. These were men in a terrible condition that were now about to be thrown against the Atlantic Wall yeah. and what they believed to be some of the most you know ferocious German defenders in in the Wehrmacht. So diaries like this, which, as I say, never been published, never been used before and, and written in great detail, set out for me the real the stark horror and terrifying sort of nature of what it was like to be in combat. You know, and, we, and Lord Lovett's account, which is this incredibly sort of flamboyant account of landing on Sword Beach. And everyone remembers it, certainly in Britain. When he lands, you know, he puts on his this this great Scottish aristocrat lands in his monogrammed shirt with his hunting rifle and his his Scottish bagpiper playing him ashore. It's fantastic stuff. But when you read Cliff Morris's diary and he talks about heads rolling around on the sand and you know men with no legs and no hands, this is the raw stuff of combat, and it brings it home to you that this was not a pleasure trip. This was really, really horrific. Yeah. So, and, and Jazz, you know, your book is, is one of many, and I'm sure there'll be many, many more in the future. What is it about this one day, this one morning that you find so compelling, and why do you think that it just continues to even grow, people, the interest in it grows rather than dissipates over time? I think that this day was absolutely critical to what was to the unfolding of the war effort, basically. If D-Day had not worked, if it had failed, as Eisenhower, of course, feared, everyone knows he wrote the a second letter describing how the landings had failed, preparing for the worst. If it had failed, it would have been extremely difficult for the Allies to have launched another invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe in the foreseeable future. It might have prolonged the war by another year, two years, three, three years. Who, who can have said what would have happened? And of course, um, one has to keep one eye on, the, on what is happening in the East. Had the Allies failed on D-Day, Stalin would have been advancing and advancing and advancing into Europe. And the whole map of Europe might have been completely different by, you know, the end of 1945. The Red Army would probably be in control of, you know, all of Germany might have got even further west. Um, so this was a critical turning point. But, you know, if, if D-Day was to be a success, as Rommel in charge of the defences of Normandy, as he feared, he knew that if the Allies had got ashore on that day and succeeded in creating a bridgehead, he said the war for the Germans was lost. There was simply no way if the Allies created a beachhead, they would be able to pour so many men and so much material onto the uh, coast of Normandy 
that Germany was defeated. So, so I think that is why so much hinges on this day. Absolutely everything was at, was at stake. Yeah. You know, and I and I think it's worth pointing out, um, uh, you know, the slender thread by which some of these accounts hang in the sense that, you know, what if that commando had not donated that diary or his family had not donated that diary? And I think of Eisenhower's famous letter that you mentioned. We had Susan Eisenhower on this show not too long ago, and she was saying that um, uh, uh, he gave that letter to his naval aide, Harry Butcher, who was keeping all the documents. Mm. He didn't want to give it to him. He was mm. like, you know, nobody wants to see that. It's not that big a deal. It's not that important. That was just something I did. Don't, you know, I do that for all of these. It's not really important. And Butcher's <laughs> like, give to me. Yeah. <laughs> right? We have to keep that. And when I was talking to the uh, folks here um, at Bedford today at the ceremony this morning, you know, it's it's it you know it it's a real duty I think to try to preserve this material, and it's a great fear that it once it's lost, it's never to be found again. Yeah, I totally agree. I'd like to add one thing actually, which is my own father-in-law, my German father-in-law, was in Normandy on D-Day. He was there, oh. and he said uh, he was an unwilling conscript. He was a Morse code operator, so he was uh, quite in the front line of things. He said when him and his men saw the amount of Allied planes coming over and the amount of weaponry they were dropping onto the uh, of the coastline of Normandy, he said they knew on the 6th of June, they said the war's lost. We've lost the war, basically. They said there's absolutely no way that the German, the Wehrmacht, can compete with what the Allies are throwing at us. And I think that the uh, it's um, perhaps not recognized enough that the the sheer, the air power that the Allies had at their command on that day was, was just devastating for the for the German defenses. Wow. Well, uh, weird. Giles, it, it has been great talking about your book and we want you to stay with us and we're going to expand the conversation a little bit. Um, you know, we're, we're going into uncharted territory for the three happy hours, so, so we don't know how it's going to go. So any any problems? The fault alone is Rick's. <laughs> the other guests at all in their power to make this show a success. That's always true. <laughs> That's always true. Uh, and as we, uh, uh, before we bring on uh, uh, Joe Balkowski and Craig Simons, I want to give uh, Chris a chance to, to talk a little bit about something that I know is dear to his heart. Yeah. Um, again, uh, I'm usually in Normandy at this time of the year, and I'm usually with a group of people showing them around. Um, and what we generally do uh, before we leave Portsmouth to, to go to Normandy, I read a letter that Tom Meehan wrote um, in the marshalling area uh, before the invasion. Uh, and it is for me um, probably the most moving explanation as to why the invasion had to happen uh, and why it was so important. And I should add that I know from another veteran who was there when he wrote this letter that he wrote this letter in one draft. So imagine this, he's 22 years old. He's about to go into combat for the first time, uh, and he writes this letter. Uh, Dearest, he's writing this to his wife, Anne. Well, I see in the papers that the Anzio beachhead is no longer that, and the casino has fallen. Looks like we ain't losing. Looking back at the grim days of 40, 41, and 42, it seems hardly possible that we should have come so far. Those were grim years, and we in the States hardly realized it. Now the shoe is on the other foot and the war has probably been decided in Europe. Yet somehow I wonder about this peace as all the writers are describing it. I'm afraid I'm a pessimist with little faith in the goodwill of mankind. Looking it over, thinking about it, brings the realization that any peace will be compromised, not everlasting. I suppose the people being as they are have thought and tried world peace for thousands of centuries, but war, like the unwanted cat, comes back. All we want is our way of life and all the handshaking and backslapping in the world won't change our ideas to conform with the other fellows. The question is not how can we ensure a permanent peace, but how can we have peace for the maximum length of time and still be ourselves unyieldingly? The natural, the human, and the inevitable. And so generation after generation has its day of crawling in filth and extracting the life of some other joker that only wanted peace but a different brand of it. We're fortunate in being Americans, at least we don't step on the underdog. I wonder if that's because there are no Americans, only a stew of immigrants, or is it because the American is the offspring of the logical European who hated oppression and loved freedom beyond life? Those great mountains and the tall timber 
the cool deep lakes and broad rivers, the green valleys and white farmhouses, the air, the sea, and the wind, the plains and the great cities, the smell of living, all must be the cause of it. And yet, with all of that, we can't get away from the rest. For every one of our millions who has that treasure in his hand, there's another million crying for that victory of life. And for each of us who wants to live in happiness and give happiness, there's another different sort of person wanting to take it away. Those people always manage to have their say, and Mars is always close at hand. We know how to win wars. We must learn now to win peace. Stick our noses in the affairs of the world. Learn politics as well as killing. Make the world accept peace whether they damn well like it or not. Here is the dove and here is the bayonet. May we never see the day again that world peace ways and like organizations dull our senses and make us anything but realists. If I ever have a son, I don't want him to go through this again. But I want him powerful enough that no one will be fool enough to touch him. He and America should be strong as hell and kind as Christ. That's the only insurance until human nature becomes a tangible thing that can be adjusted and made workable. Tom. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Amazing, amazing letter. Um, I want to remind everybody that uh, we're history happy hour today is um, not very happy at the moment, but is uh, <laughs> oh. is uh, is um, uh, uh, focusing on D-Day. And we've been talking with Giles Milton, and I just want to remind again that, that Giles' book uh, is the fabulous. But Giles, people have been telling me that they've been ordering it while you've been talking. So I don't know. You can't do anything better than that. Uh, that's the U.S. title is Solar S Soldier, Sailor, Frogman, Spy. And in the British title is D-Day, The Soldier Story. I vote for the British title. But either way, it's uh, the content is the same, and it's a, a terrific book. So we're going to now, uh, uh, though, bring on a few uh, other people, Giles, to, to crowd into the conversation with us here. And I want to introduce two people. I'm going to bring them on first, and then we're going to introduce them uh, as well. Um, and we have uh, uh, Joe Balkowski and Craig Simons, two very distinguished D-Day historians. And I mean, I know distinguished, you know, nobody likes to be described as distinguished. That sounds a little too, you know, stuffy. But uh, Joe Balkowski is the author of Omaha Beach and Utah Beach, and of course, uh, Beyond the Beachhead, this, one of the volumes of his series on the 29th Division. Terrific books all. Uh, Craig Simons, uh, who is muted, Craig, just noting that you're muted, uh, is the author of uh, Operation Neptune, which is the story of the naval operations surrounding D-Day, and a terrific view at that. And, and most important credential for these two guys, they have both been on History Happy Hour exactly. before. <laughs> so, so they know everything that they're in for. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, so welcome. Did you did you bring a cocktail this time, or did we throw you off? By yes, and immediately drink? grabbed the drinks. <laughs> <laughs> we all we're all Calvados. Yeah. Calvados. Oh, Calvados, perfect. Way to go, Joe. <laughs> Joe <laughs> not bad, but but did you bring enough for everyone, Joe? <laughs> I did because I'm not going to drink it. If I drank it, I'd be I'd have a lampshade on my head. Right? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you, you saw it first here. <laughs> and uh, and I want to mention, I want to give Joe just a chance to speak for a moment because Joe has just returned from the memorial service uh, of a soldier who was there on D-Day. Joe, uh, tell us about a little bit about Ray Gaddy's. Well, I just returned uh, two hours ago from the memorial service for Ray Gaddy's. His picture you see there, he was a member of Company G of the 501st Parachute Infantry of the 101st Airborne Division. Um, uh, what can I say? I, I've been very, very blessed in my life uh, when I started doing uh, World War II research to have known these men when they were young, much younger than I am now, I hate to say. And um, they developed into dozens and dozens of surrogate father figures, and Ray was one of them. And um, every time I do a eulogy at one of these funerals, I honestly begin convinced that I'm not going to be able to get through it because of the memories that flood through my mind as I'm doing it. Um, but I thankfully got through this one. And uh, as Ray used to tell me, he just said, speak from the heart when you talk about D-Day. And 
I took that lesson to heart and I spoke from the heart about him and uh, he will be missed and uh, there are not many D-Day veterans I know anymore. Mm -hmm. So this, this was a special one. Yeah. Well, we said we were going to talk about uh, D-Day controversies, and I think that is broadly what we're going to talk about. But I, and, and I want to have a, a conversation, so I want everyone to feel free to jump in, interrupt, correct. I can and, interrupt you whenever I want? Always, Chris. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you do. So I do. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, I'm, I'm muting Chris next. And... Um, <laughs> Now that Craig's unmuted, I think someone should be muted. Um, and, but I want to just throw out the the very broad question, and I will let our our, our uh, you know um, I let Craig answer first because he has not had a, really had a chance to speak yet. Um, but the broad question of was D Day necessary? Was this a necessary operation for us to do to win the war, or was there some other way? to do it than to have to throw these guys on these beaches. And Craig, you can start and then it's a free for all after that. Yeah. There first of all, there's always another way. It doesn't mean it's the better way, but there's always another way. I've just finished writing a book on uh Chester Nimitz and the last couple of chapters deal with the whole question of whether or not Japan could be defeated by blockade and bombing without an invasion. Was an invasion really necessary? And one of the issues that bubbled to the top in that conversation was, would the American people, and of course in the case of Europe it would be the peoples of Britain as well, the other allies, uh, agree to a war that might last till 1947, avoiding an invasion, blockading and bombing until finally it became possible to win the war without an invasion. So yes, it would be possible, but not necessarily the best alternative because you don't know whether the political will was there to sustain the extra 16, 18, 20 months of war that might be necessary to win a war without an invasion. So in that context, I would argue that the invasion was necessary, partly because I think it's important, particularly to the American people, the British obviously have been in a lot longer than we had anyway, um, but in addition to that, there's the whole uh, Anglo-American pulling and tugging that had been going on since 1941, uh, and even before, frankly, uh, with the Americans saying, well, look, if we're going to fight Germany first, let's do it right now. And the British saying, well, 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 yes, that's all well and good, but you know you have to go at the right moment. Uh, and, and this was the moment when those two sides could agree to meet. So. Was there another way? There was. Was it a better way? I frankly doubt it. Uh, if you look at it from the perspective of the very highest reaches of the American High Command, I agree with Craig. I mean, from the word go, uh, after Pearl Harbor, it was well understood uh, in, in, in the American High Command that something like E-Day was going to have to happen. Famously, for the 1942 uh, graduation speech at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, General Marshall said, I know to great applause, he said this, we will land in France. And he said this more than two years before the D-Day operation. So in terms of the grand strategy as uh, thought up by people like Marshall and, of course, approved by Roosevelt, uh, D-Day was an absolutely necessary step to win the war. Remember, George Marshall also famously said that in a democracy, you cannot fight a seven years war, referring to the 18th century conflict in Europe. He said the people demand results. And uh, from the beginning, Marshall said, we must fight it violently and put our best men against their best men on the on a central front and uh, drive to Berlin, no questions asked. So I, I believe wholeheartedly that it was necessary. And if I could just add something, I think uh, it's very interesting to look at Churchill's perspective as well. I think that Churchill uh, had a deep uh, suspicion of Soviet Russia and Stalin's intentions. And that uh, Stalin, of course, had been pushing for the uh, Western allies to, to open up a second front in, in, uh, in Europe. 
But I think that Churchill was also really worried that uh, if the Allies didn't land soon, sooner rather than later, that much of Eastern and Central Europe might have been swallowed up by the Red Army. And when you look at what actually unfolded, I mean, this is this is pretty pretty uh, close to what what happened. Stalin was determined to hold on to all territory captured by the Red Army, and this would come out in at Yalta and po later at Potsdam. So uh, I think uh, Church certainly was keeping one eye eye on what was going to hap happen after the war and who was going to control what. So, so one of the other, um, uh, well, one of the other controversies. We're going to drop some big bombshells here, and I know um, this is one of the big ones. But one of the big debates, uh, not amongst the Allies, but amongst the Germans, is the method for defense. Um, you know, we, there's the famous account of, of Rommel. He wants to meet them on the beach, and he stopped, stopped them right at the water line. Uh, von Rundstedt says that we should have a, a reserve further back from the beaches, let the Allies land uh, and strike them then. So, you know, in the, in the, in the world of great big D-Day controversies, I'd like to get kind of your thoughts. Who was right, Rommel or Rundstedt? Ooh. Greg, you want to go first? Oh, okay, sure. I'm a Navy guy. I'm a Navy guy. That's one about German high strategy. Um, I, I think either one, if they had fully invested in it, would have been better than kind of the uh, goofing around they did. Where is it going to be and, and, and how should we respond? Uh, kind of at the beach, but also hoarding our resources <clears throat> buying in 100% to either one of those might have been better for the Germans than, than the argument that they had. On the other hand, I don't think either one of them would have won the day. So, right. I think my opinion has changed in the last 30 years. I used to be of the Rommel camp, but I think I'm now in the von Rundstedt camp. Uh, yeah. um, who was it? Frederick the Great, who said as uh, one of his many military maxims, uh, he who defends everything defends nothing. Yeah. And that really is uh, very applicable to what the Germans were trying to do. There was no hope to defend every point on the northwest European coast that the Allies could hit. And, I, you know, I guess this goes to the, the vital, vital point that Rommel's strategy could not work as long as the Allies could keep the secret of where and when the invasion would come to the last moment. And that is exactly what happened. It's one of the most phenomenal, uh, I mean, probably the most pheno phenomenal accomplishment of D-Day is that we were able to keep the secret right up until the last minutes of the invasion. Uh, had the Germans learned 24, 48 hours, even, you know, even worse, a week ahead of time, boy, uh, the results would have been profoundly different. So the, the, the foundational pillar to D-Day success is keeping the secret. And that is truly amazing that it was kept. Good. Giles, you yeah, want to weigh yeah. in on this? Just, just to add one sort of, I, I broadly agree with what's been said, but just to add the, I mentioned before the uh, air power, I just think that the the Allies had such overwhelming superiority in the air that what other, what either possibility uh, was at great risk as long as the cloud cover remained, uh, you know, as long as the skies remained uh, reasonably free, free of cloud, the uh, the Germans were going to have great problems moving up their tanks into the beachhead. I think they would have been attacked from the air. And uh, would have been, as we saw later, you know, in the in the in the days and weeks that followed, they would have been picked off from the air. So I think uh, both Rommel and the Rundstadt would have had uh, great problems uh, over the days that followed the landings. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's almost like a game in which there there turns out to be no right answer, right? Can you right. can you be right. not, be not with Rommel or von Rundstadt? Well, just that just say, gets people topics to keep writing books. About. You were <laughs> you, it was it was not going to work, guys. Whatever uh, defense you used against, I mean, was that was there a, a defense? Was there any defense against that? Well, apparently, I, apparently not. No, but, I, <laughs> but, but I still think for, for all that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put my oar in the water here, and I'm using a nautical metaphor quite deliberately. I, Giles, <laughs> I, I appreciate everything you say about the importance of air power, but I'm a Navy guy, and I'm going to say <laughs> that in an amphibious operation, you have to get to the beach first. 
And one of the things that the Germans did was they just couldn't pick out the strategy that they wanted. Hitler would intervene, he'd overrule, he'd make his decision based on the gut instinct and overrule the, the uh, OKW and, and that would make be the decision. If the Germans had committed to a maritime strategy of destroying the North Atlantic sea lanes 100% and done what Dunitz did, that would have been better from their perspective. If they had done everything they could to deny the Allies control of the sea, not just the air, Giles, but the sea, they might have had a better chance. But instead, they said, well, we're going to commit some to this and some to that, and we're going to invade Russia while we're hold off Britain. And too many things, too many times, without a clear, focused, directed, grand strategy. So. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's true. But, but I would like to get your opinion. Even though they never, they never got the strategy down, I agree with you, Craig, that they didn't really deal with the naval component soon enough. How close did D-Day come to coming off the rails? I mean, for all of that, how on that morning, particularly Omaha Beach, but elsewhere, how could it have come off the rails? Well, I, I'm going to kind of cheat on the question by backing it up. You, you ask about that day. By the time the sun comes up on the 6th of June, all the pieces were more or less in place or as in place as they could put them. And, and that was the product of 14 months or more of serious labor. They had to build the ships to get them there, the tanks that the ships would carry. I mean, the logistic input to all of this was the biggest part. So when would it, could it have come off the rails? And I think the answer to that is the inability to uh, create and sustain the sea lift capability to get the material and the manpower to Britain and then the material and the manpower across the channel I know 62,000 of them already lived there, Giles. I'm paying attention. <laughs> uh, but I think without that sea lift capability, D Day cannot happen. Once June 6th arrives, and there are a sufficient number of, particularly LSTs, but all of the various sea lift uh, components that made up the invasion, uh, nothing I think was going to stop that at that point. Uh, but it could have come off the rails with decisions about uh, construction priorities, building priorities, uh, if they had gone awry early, and so they just simply wouldn't have been ready, and they almost weren't anyway. The number of LSTs in particular, you know, uh, uh, Eisenhower made it clear to Marshall, he said, you know, we have enough LSTs to sustain the invasion force through D-Day plus three, after that, nothing. And that's when they realized, oh, well, okay, one more month of building LSTs, one more a shipment of LSTs across the channel, and even then there were just enough to get it done. So it's the sea lift capability, I think, that's the bottleneck of this whole operation. But I say that as a naval guy, so there you go. I wonder if I can uh, actually add, add a question, really, uh, which intrigues me, is that what would have happened uh, to both Craig and Joe uh, if Omaha had not succeeded? Could, would Was the whole of D-Day uh, in danger if the Americans had not got ashore on D-Day? Because it's a question I wrestle with and I, I don't know the answer. Joe, you well, go my, first. My opinion is that, uh, well, number one, I agree wholeheartedly with Craig, D-Day could not have gone off the rails, particularly at the risk of repeating myself, uh, when the secret was kept until the morning of June 6th, there was no way it could fail. Part of that was the Allies allied grand strategy which was overwhelming force one of the great precepts of the military strategy uh giles my opinion is that omaha it's been exaggerated how close omaha came to failing it didn't really come that close the carnage was terrible but you know the the application of force on that beach was it was impossible for the germans to throw that back they started the day with no more than a thousand men on that beach, and we were going to put thirty-five thousand men there within sixteen hours. Uh, you know that whole story about General Bradley contemplating pulling the troops off the beach. There's absolutely no historical corroboration for that whatsoever. Um, I believe that was never even considered. And you, Craig, as a naval guy, uh, you well know that the uh, in, a, in an amphibious assault, the Navy controls the. Uh, uh, invasion until the troops were ashore, ashore. And Admiral John Hall, 
famously said on the morning of, of, of D-Day on, on Omaha Beach, he said, I never considered doing anything but co continuing with the plan. So, I, you know, I, I can't even contemplate Omaha failing. Had, it, had something terrible happened and the Germans had known the secret ahead of time, well, yeah, then you got a 35, 40 mile gap between Utah Beach and Gold Beach and you know the Germans would have exploited that. But the odds of that, you know, in my view, were near nil. Hmm. Well, I'm going to accept Giles' uh, uh, hypothesis at the beginning and say that if it had failed, could the invasion have continued by saying yes? And these stories that Joe referred to that supposedly Bradley was saying, oh, no, we've got to pull them off the beach. If, any, if there's any truth to any of that, it was and move them to Utah Beach so that now Utah Beach would have twice the, and, and yes, there'd be a gap in the line, but if you're still pouring, and Joe gave the numbers, those kinds of resources ashore, uh, the Germans would have had a very difficult time, even absent uh, Omaha Beach. But that's all hypothetical, because I think Joe's right. I don't think it was going to happen. What John Leslie Hall said that morning was, the only thing we can do is just keep pouring resources ashore and they'll win out at the end of the day. And of course, that's exactly what happened. So I want to remind everybody that we're watching tag team wrestling here. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we're in uh, the third round. No, we're, we're uh, talking about D-Day and we're going to be going on for about another uh, uh, 25, 30 minutes. And um, I wanted to, we had a, a, one of our viewers uh, 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 raise the question of, um, you know, how critical was Eisenhower to the success of the invasion? And I would add to that, so if we're going to evaluate Eisenhower and just, just to throw some stones in the water, let's talk about Montgomery as well. And, you know, is it, are these both the right people for the different jobs that they have? Uh, is Eisenhower the right person and Montgomery not, or vice versa? Uh, just, you know, maybe some evaluation there. Can I go first on that one? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to surprise you. I, I am okay. one of Mont. I'm an American, but I'm one of Monty's greatest supporters. There is no doubt in my mind that the the overall success of Operation Overlord, if you look at look at it on a grand sense, was in great. Uh, Monty had an enormous role in that. Uh, you know, now, of course, Americans love to hate him, the ego. There are a lot of Britons who hate him as well. But uh, at this stage of the war, the working relationship between Bradley and Monty was very high. Uh, Monty was really the, 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 the true planner of the operation once January 1944 hit. You know the story of how Monty said the original Cossack plan is, is too narrow. We have to double the invasion front. And... You know, he, uh, as his chief of staff, Reddy Deegan Gann said, he, he pounded his fist on the table and he said, if you don't do this, it's going to fail. And, you know, in, a, in the grand scheme of things, as an American, it may surprise people, but I think Monty is one of the people you really have to look to in, a, in the grand scheme uh, of how uh, Overlord succeeded. Is that, is that just on that morning, Joe, or for the whole campaign? Well, we won't get into the rest of it. Okay, the all right. <laughs> but, but I, but I, I mean, saw... think, go ahead, things Joe. start to go sour, but we're talking about D-Day. Oh, that's right. Okay. So, yeah. I, I'm sure that I saw Craig Simon shaking his head there. So I, yeah, I, I can't tell you. I cannot tell you how hard it is for me to disagree with Joe. I mean, I, <laughs> Joe is, I, I go to Joe's books like it's scripture. Um, so it, this is a hard thing for me to do, but I think if you're really looking at the highest level of strategic decision making, Eisenhower is the guy that makes this work. And it's not because he's a military commander. He never led troops in combat in his entire military career. But he had the political dexterity to make this coalition uh, invasion. And as someone mentioned, Giles, I think earlier, it's not just Americans. It's not even just Americans and British. It's not even just Americans and British and Canadians. But it's also Poles and French and other people. And to make all of that work, you need somebody with that kind of nuanced political dexterity that Montgomery absolutely lacked. 
and that Eisenhower had in spades. If you reverse the jobs they had, I think this thing could have come entirely unglued. Now, maybe Joe would say, well, yeah, but that's because Montgomery was in the place he needed to be, and, and that may entirely be possible. But if I'm choosing between Eisenhower and Montgomery, that is an easy call for me. <laughs> No, I agree well, with you, Craig. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, Giles should have his turn. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm take total <laughs> agreement with Craig. I mean, Montgomery was an impossible man. I mean, uh, a lot of Brits didn't like him and didn't get on with him at all. But I totally agree. It was uh, Eisenhower that was able to hold this enormous coalition together. You know, I was there, I was in Portsmouth two years ago when there was the 75th, and to see the heads of state of all these nations uh, who uh, comprised the forces on D-Day. This was a, a major political operation as well. And uh, Eisen, Eisenhower was the man for the job. Oops. Sorry. Uh, one final word. Yes. <laughs> I agree. I agree with you, Craig. It couldn't have been done without Ike. But I will say that Monty was the man who, uh, uh, he, you know, in, on January 4th, 1944, I believe, he called his first meeting at St. Paul's School, where he had gone to school as a boy. At that time, Ike was still in the United States, and there's a very famous letter that Monty writes to Ike, and he says, this is what we need. Can you get it for us? So, yeah, you're right. Uh, Ike was the man to get what the Allies needed, and he was the perfect man for the job. But we, we, wanna, uh, we, we, we don't want to neglect matters of the naval side of this because we've been forcing Craig to talk about <laughs> tanks and strategy and other stuff. So, so I want to bring up uh, a, a question, Craig, for you and of course for everybody else to jump in on, which is um, the, the, the very famous Mulberry Harbors uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, allegedly Churchill's idea or everything's Churchill's idea, I think, uh, in World War II. <laughs> And, um, you know, that are towed over these massive harbors, uh, towed over uh, piece by piece, put together. The one at Omaha Beach is pretty much destroyed a couple of weeks later. The one uh, at Aramanche, I think, lasts for six weeks or something. Were these brilliant uh, ideas that were vital to uh, winning in Normandy, or were they Not. Not. <laughs> okay, moving on. Show me to elaborate on Next that. question. <laughs> I think, let me back up just a little bit to say, I think there is a tendency, uh, particularly on the Allied side, but maybe it's a human tendency in, in warfare or contests of any kind, to, to want to say, look how clever we were. And, and I go back to Hobart's funnies. You, most of you know what I'm talking about. These uh, sort of trick gimmick weapons that Churchill really loved and uh, and Montgomery's brother-in-law loved uh, this guy Hobart, and uh, and and a, a lot of them are cute and clever, and we can pat ourselves on the back and say, "Weren't we clever to have thought of that?" And I think some of that explains why Mulberry is such a big myth uh, here. We were clever, boy. We fooled those Germans. They thought we needed a harbor to offload, and we brought our own with us. And there are stories about that. How at a meeting in Quebec. Well, gee, we have to capture a harbor. What if we don't get one in time? And somebody said, well, let's take one with us. And from that comes this tremendous idea to build artificial harbors off two of the beaches. Um, this is the one, I think, at Omaha here. Um, and, and typical for Churchill, he jumped on this as a clever way to outwit those Nazis. Uh, and everything had a code name, you know, the mulberries would start with bombardons and then there'd be corn cobs and gooseberries and whales and lobnitz piers and all these clever little gimmicky things. And it absorbed an enormous amount of material, the millions of square yards of concrete, hundreds of miles of rebar. I mean, it was just a, a, a Frankenstein monster. And the one on Omaha Beach, you said lasted a couple of weeks, it lasted three days. And in those three days, there was no more offloaded in the artificial harbor than was offloaded when they were coming in by the LSDs over the beach. So I don't think you can demonstrate in any way that they were either necessary or that they saved the invasion or they were anything other than something we invested a lot of energy and effort unnecessarily in to make ourselves feel really clever. Now, Joe, 
What do you think? I'm with you wholeheartedly on that. Oh, one, Rick. yeah, really am. <laughs> and you know, if you look at the Allied logistical uh, history of how mm -hmm. the armies were supplied once the campaign began in earnest, it's amazing. Supplies were coming over Omaha Beach in in huge numbers as late as mid-November. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and so really, what good did the Mulberry do? The only reason they shut down the, the uh, offloading of supplies directly over Omaha Beach in November was that Antwerp had just been opened after they opened up the Shell Channel. Yeah. Uh, they probably could have kept landing supplies over Omaha up until the beginning of winter. Yeah. Uh, it really made no difference whatsoever. But I mean, I, you know, I'm talking I'm from the American perspective. So I'm, I'm with just you. Just let now. me put it. All right. You and me, Joe. Let me All right. Stick it echo, Charles. <laughs> right. Let me put a British perspective. Uh, I have to say, I totally agree with both Craig and Joe, but they will never be allowed into the into Britain again, I don't think, saying that. Because <laughs> we're not allowed. We're not allowed to say these things in our country. It's like, as I said earlier, Dunkirk was somehow a great triumph for the Britain, you know, and the Mulberry Harbors. You can't you can't say that. You're not allowed to anymore. But I think uh, a couple of things you raised, I think amphibious tanks, yeah, they were they didn't really work on Omaha Beach at all, uh, a complete disaster in fact. But I think they did work on some of the other beaches, on Juno, on, on uh, Sword and Gold. They did prove they had some sort of value. And if we're talking about the sort of clever, clever things that happened, I think one of the things that should be mentioned is the intelligence operation uh, prior to D-Day, because I think this was, uh, this was a world work of genius so the, the Germans they knew neither when the Allies were coming and nor did they know where they were coming and this was partly because of the excuse me because of the system the uh, counter system that we had for Britain and all those with the phantom wow. armies the inflatable tanks that have been scattered across the countryside the Germans didn't know where the Allies were coming and I think that was a clever clever thing that the uh, the Allies pulled off you know, Giles has just given me an opportunity to mention the Ghost Army, and we are. Oh, <laughs> wait, I'm going to see. Cheers oh, yeah. there. So because, uh, 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 and this is one that I, 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 I believe I'm right on here, but um, there were no inflatable tanks that were part of the Operation Fortitude Deception. So there were inflatable tanks that were used by the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops uh, in action in uh, France and Luxembourg and Germany. They are widely believed. I mean, I, there's a million books you can read about uh, inflatable tanks being part of Operation Fortitude. But if you look at the original plans uh, uh, laid out, uh, th they didn't want to use them. The, the planners didn't want to use inflatable tanks because they thought the risks far outweighed the benefits, especially since England was kind of full with American tanks anyway at that point. And you didn't really need to show the tanks in a particular place, you know, and you wouldn't really have that need until, uh, if you think about it, like a week, if you were going to use them, you wouldn't use them until like a week before the invasion. And the one exception to that is that the 23rd, the Ghost Army, did do a... Uh, three practice deceptions um, called cabbage, cheese, and spam uh, that were in the um, in a tank proving ground that was within the area of the so-called first U.S. Army Group buildup, the fake buildup uh, under supposedly under General Patton. So in that sense, that's probably that's probably the beginning of the belief that inflatable tanks part of the fortitude deception when really fortitude is mostly about the double cross system yeah. uh, and uh, and then some American radio deception that goes on from the 3103rd uh, radio uh, operation so uh, I, I'm just uh, it's the one uh, are you done now are you that done? I know are you done now? <laughs> I have the opportunity to say it um, okay. and um, but I, you know, I, but I want to go back to the Mulberry question just because I'm going to bring in uh, a, a challenge. Nobody here had the, had you know wanted to go up against you, uh, uh, Craig. But we did have um, uh, a viewer who said, uh, you know, was the is this hindsight? You know, is this is this just hindsight uh, when you're looking at the Mulberries? You know, uh, uh, oh, it, it, but but maybe it would have been needed. You know, I, I'll put it out to you and let you respond to that. 
Well, I, I, obviously, a lot of things. Historians are really good with hindsight. We know everything after the fact. <laughs> um, but in this particular case, I think it's not just hindsight. If you ask the operational commanders, and people did ask the operational commanders months before this, even at the inception of the idea, they said it's a terrible idea, but I'm not getting going to get in front of in Churchill's way. Uh, uh, John Leslie <laughs> Hall, who was cited earlier, who was the commander of the naval commander off Omaha Beach, when he was briefed on this months beforehand, he said, this is ridiculous. One storm will wash the whole thing away. And of course, that's exactly what happened. So the operational people who had actually to do it, thought, not universally, but I would say two thirds, thought it was a terrible idea. But the politicians thought it was a great idea and they controlled the money. And that was the decision that was made. And I think this really does go back to, it's almost like a a uh, public schoolboy saying, boy, we pulled one over on the old chaps, you know, we we outsmarted them this time. And, and that's what was going on here. But uh, I think it was known in advance that this wasn't going to be essential. The American way of war, as Russ Wigley said many years ago, is to overwhelm the enemy with material and firepower and just pour that stuff ashore and never mind the trickery. So I think that's where most people were even at the time. So, so Giles, well, how would you rate Craig's a British accent on a one to 10 scale? <laughs> he, he's, he's allowed into the country now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so this, this next question is from uh, one of our viewers, but uh, certainly one that I would be curious to get your thoughts on. This is uh, from Frank Cook. And he, he asked, he said, uh, as the person originally charged with driving the cross channel invasion plan, should British Lieutenant General Frederick Morgan have received more credit for the eventual success of D-Day? Did you did you did you put that question? Up? I did, didn't. No. Are you actually Frank Cook? I, I no. <laughs> oh, I'm I, Frank. I vote yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I think he's absolutely right. Morgan is one of my heroes. Uh, Overlord uh, could not have happened without him, and. Uh, he had very little time to do something that was supposed to be the momentous uh, operation of World War II. And I think part of the reason he didn't get uh, uh, limelight uh, in the aftermath of the invasion is that Monty hated him. And as I said, Monty had a lot of bad traits, uh, and this was one of them. He did not forgive uh, fellow general officers of the British Army who, who uh, cooperated very smoothly with the Americans. And, and Morgan and Ike were best buddies, yep. as it should have been. Yeah. Uh, you know, Morgan was present at, on VE Day in the surrender at yep. Reims. That shows mm -hmm. you how much Ike liked him. But no, I mean, in short, Morgan is the pillar that makes yep. it all happen. Monty makes the plan a little better, but he had more resources. But without Morgan, we wouldn't have had overboard. Let me just add, by the way, that Morgan was told his his orders were to plan an invasion for a three division assault. Right. So that when it goes from three to five, it's not because Morgan underestimated the difficulties. It's because he was told this is your brief. You have to work within these parameters. And and whether or not it was uh, actually Montgomery who said, well, we have to have five or Eisenhower recognized it even before he left the Mediterranean, which I suspect the idea of shifting from three to five was not a failure on Morgan's part. He was doing the job he was assigned to do. Right? Well, I think the other thing, you know, that's, um, uh, well, too, lots to be admirable about Morgan, but also he's planning other operations at the same time. Mm. And that, yeah. Overlord is just one of the things he's working on. He's working on the deception plan. He, and he doesn't know which ones are real. He's supposed right. to plan Sledgehammer and Overlord and all these Roundup all at the same time. And yeah, he doesn't right. know which one of these you know, a hidden pea under the yeah. shell is the real one. Because yeah. I, I think we talked to you about this, Craig, that, that, that some of this, he, he may feel that he's being asked to plan things basically for the benefit of showing the Americans we're planning something. Yeah. 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 All right, so we all have to... And, and, and for the benefit of showing Stalin that we're planning something, it should be added. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. But, so uh, we all have well, to read well, more about it, Freddie Morgan. Didn't General uh, Alan Brook uh, throw the uh, tentative overlord idea to uh morgan and say well here it is it won't bloody well work but you must make it right yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
That's so an interesting does. way to start a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, then it says also that, you know, he, they make reference to it. I guess it was Barker who worked with Morgan. And, and uh, there's some discussion that Morgan gets word that, you know, we want you to plan this so the Americans, like you said, think that we're busy, but it doesn't really have to work. Right. And Morgan alerts Marshall. So Marshall's ready when they have this discussion. And Marshall just put puts the kibosh on it. And I, I've often been amazed. I mean, you figure Morgan is a British officer. He's grown up in the British Army. These are all of his his associates. The prime minister says, you know, we kind of like to have this sort of work out this way. And a, most, a lot of people would say, yes, sir, and that's what he would do. But Morgan says, no, this is too important. This is an allied operation. Yeah. And he tips mm. off the Americans, which I think is a pretty, pretty gutsy move on his part. Yep. So. Well, um, uh, I you know I, I think, <laughs> don't even I can't believe Rick's out of ammo. I know, <laughs> not <Just> true. Like, <laughs> I've got some in the case back here. Okay, all right. Good. Um, no, I I wanted to uh, 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 one of the one of my favorite uh, D Day controversies, if you will, uh, is Point to Hawk. Point to Hawk, and I, I would start. I guess I would let Joe start with this. Joe will put you on the spot first. It, you know, and 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 Chris and I talk about this sometimes. There's a, you know, everybody loves the the the, the exciting elite unit operations, um, and the Rangers are an elite unit. Just listen to them; they'll tell you. And uh, and so is is Point to Hawk a? Is it important? Is it a valuable use of resources? Uh, it's certainly gotten a lot of attention post D-Day. It is, you know, what is often the very first thing remembered. It's often what people really want to go and see. Is that appropriate? Is that right? Yes, it was an absolute pillar of the operation. And I, I, I'm very skeptical of anybody who says it was. I, all you have to do is stand there and, and, and see the reason why. I mean, you can easily see in, in plain view the anchorages of the uh, Utah invasion force, and you can easily see the anchorages of the Omaha invasion force. And may I remind you that the six field pieces that were supposed to be uh, entrenched in, at the Point Duhok position were no ordinary guns. These were not 155 millimeter howitzers. These were 155 millimeter French, actually, cannon or guns with a gigantic range and more importantly, uh, tremendous pinpoint accuracy. So there's no way in, in hell that American planners could have tolerated six guns. Now we didn't, again, in hindsight, know exactly what had happened to those six guns, but it was obvious that they could be there. And if they could be there, you had to do something about it. There was no way in hell we would tolerate having those six pinpoint guns being able to fire in daylight on anchored ships. I mean, it, it, you know, there, there's no doubt in my mind that the Point to Hawk operation was mandatory. I mean, perhaps we could have committed more force to it, but you know, remember we were supposed to commit more force to it, but an entire battalion of Rangers right. ended up shifting to Omaha Beach. Right. So that's my short answer. I, I agree. I'll just add one more bit to that, and, and that is that I think psychologically, somehow it's even more ennobling that the Germans had moved those guns, and they were not there. I know we didn't know that, the men doing it didn't know that, the planners didn't know that, but the fact that it ended up being, you know, of the 200, I'm going to make up the, I think the numbers are right here, 225 that began the assault and the hunt, um, began the climb, and 108 got to the top and, and got that position. And that's such a sacrificial, heroic, brave thing to have done that the fact that the guns weren't there and somehow almost ennobles it further. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, and I think just to add to that, I mean, uh, as, as everyone has said, hindsight is a great thing. We ha a lot of uh, what people watching uh, will not know that the British had a very similar operation uh, to take out Merville bat Battery, which was believed to have powerful guns that could reach the British beaches. Um, uh, this was this battery was taken in the night at great cost uh, in human life, 
And it turned out uh, a bit like uh, Point du Hoc, that the guns were, were not there or could not have uh, no. affected the beaches. Um, but, you know, they, that was not known at the time. It had to be done in case they were there. I mean, ultimately, right, you have to, you, 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 you see all these things and, and, and you have to, to figure out, you know, that it might happen. So, um, uh, and take advantage of that. So, um, that makes sense. Chris, you, we're, we're, we're approaching last question time. I know. So, That's so. why I have. I have two more. I'm trying to get them in. All right. Get, get, get all, right. all on, babe. So, um, uh, I've talked to Joe about this before, but I'd like to get your thoughts. Um, Max Hastings, another one of the, the D-Day historians, has written uh, in his book about the campaign, uh, the kind of man-for-man, -man, soldier, soldier for soldier, the Germans were just better. And the, kind of the reason that we win in Normandy is there's just so much of us. Um, and I've always had a little bit of trouble with that analysis, but but you're the expert. So I'm kind of curious what you think of you know German combat efficiency versus um, Allied combat efficiency, and is, is Hastings onto something or is he kind of uh, he, off I, the mark i think he's off the mark i'll be i'll be blunt I, i'll tell you what when i read max hastings book when it came out on normandy which i believe was in 1984 yeah. uh it actually was a driving force for me to write my book beyond the beachhead because i knew the veterans of the 29th division and i did not see what max hastings uh related in his uh chapter on american mm -hmm. tactical proficiency I mean, I will be the first to confess that the armies approach tactics and operations in fundamentally different ways. Yes, German soldiers were very, very tenacious and they were superbly armed and they were very, very good at using those weapons. They were superb on defense. And the Americans, in, on the other hand, were superb in some of the things that the Germans were pretty miserable in, such as on-call artillery fire, having Hyper Cub airplanes flying over the line and pinpointing artillery shells within minutes where they had to be. But, uh, you know, I think Max Hastings, he's a brilliant, brilliant historian, and uh, I, I feel certainly I cannot come up to his league, but um, I will tell you that I think he fell too much uh, for the temptation of believing the old SLA Marshall philosophy that American soldiers, uh, for some inexplicable reason, did not fire their weapons in combat, which is, you know, I think another driving reason why I wrote my books. It's just not true. Yeah. American soldiers, uh, particularly when you look at the divisions that landed on D-Day, these were superbly, wonderfully trained divisions. The 29th Division had trained for this moment for three and a half years. They had weeded out every man who couldn't do it. Even those who were moderately reluctant were were weeded out. Uh, in terms of morale and, and fighting ability and, 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 and the ability to withstand the carnage that the German defenders were going to inflict, I honestly think that he was off the mark on that by a, by a wide margin, actually. Yeah. You got other other points of view? Just very, very briefly, to go back to my <clears throat> German father-in-law, who is uh, near the Carantan Peninsula, I mean, he said the, the vast numbers of Ost Battalion, who, uh, these were conscripts into the German army, they didn't know what they were fighting for, they didn't know why they were there, and they didn't want to fight. And uh, there were large numbers of them, uh, which massively weakened, I think, the uh, German defences uh, in Normandy. When they, when they As soon as they could throw down their weapons, they did. I agree with that. The German army in Normandy, it had some elite units, but it, 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 a fair degree of the troops there were miserable, unhappy, and and ready to call it quits. So I don't think yeah. if you had to put your money on an army, you would put your, your money on the British, Canadians and Americans for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, the, first of all, this is about land war, so I don't even really know what I'm talking about here. But let me <laughs> let me say some words anyway, just because. And 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 I, you, you both of you hinted at this already, and that is first of all, not all of the defenders of the Omaha Beach area were German. There were these, uh, you know, conscripted teenage uh, boys, really becoming men, but boys really who had been drafted into the German army, who didn't really want to be there. Those who were defending Cherbourg, by the way, uh, were eager to give themselves up, and their German commanders would not hear of it. 
So that's one thing. The other thing is that it depends on when we're talking about. If we're talking about 1942, then yeah, I might bet on the Germans. If we're talking about 1944, I'm not sure that's valid anymore. I mean, you can't compare Kazarin Pass with Omaha Beach. Uh, but the Germans were wonderful fighters. And uh, the Americans were fighting because they had to. Now, how much that matters, I'm not really sure. But I'll just throw that in. Well, I want to, uh, we, we are reaching the end of our, our D-Day uh extravaganza chris can i can i wrap it up or do you really need to get that no, last question i guess in? go ahead Rick. it go seems ahead. like a good note to end on and, and craig we we invite you to to dive into the land war anytime you you, you, you okay. seem you seem a pretty de decent voice on that i'm going to uh ask you folks to hang on for a moment but we're going to give the last word here to um, uh, a veteran uh, appropriately perhaps a D-Day veteran and let him tell his story it's a gentleman that I spoke to yesterday uh, here at the National D-Day Memorial I have to just find the video here and his name is uh, Louis Graziano he comes on and tells you his name at the beginning but it's a little soft so you might not hear it right away it's a very interesting distinction that he was at D-Day but and at Omaha Beach but he was also at the surrender in uh, Reims, as the French say, or Reims, as everybody else says. So uh, I'm going to let Louis uh, tell you his, uh, his story of what went on, and then we'll come back and wrap and say goodbye. Louis Graziano, I was with Eisenhower Special Troop Command in European Theater. So I was in the third wave, and I drove a gasoline truck off the LST onto the shore to the beach and I jumped out of it and got all my machine guns and things with me and laid down with the dead soldiers and I crawled up slowly till I got under the cliff and the Germans were up on top of the cliff shooting down at us and I uh got my flamethrower out and my buddy and we put the, the cliff on fire underneath where the German were shooting down from up there and got rid of those uh, machine guns. I was in charge of that war room where the surrender was signed and I set all the chairs up for all the ones that are coming in to sign the surrender. Well, when Germans come in, they didn't have much to say to nobody. They come in with their faces, sadly, I guess, and they, they would just clip their heels instead of saying anything. The main thing there was, I knew after we, that was signed, I should get to go home soon. But then after they uh, signed that, I had to take them up to Eisenhower's room, up the hall, and he asked them if everything was fine. And I said yes, and they clipped their heels together and, and walked out. Wow. This unconditional surrender has been achieved by teamwork. Teamwork not only among all the Allies participating, but among all the services land, sea, and air. To every subordinate that has been in this command of almost five million allies, I owe debt of gratitude that can never be repaid. The only repayment that can be made to them is a deep appreciation and lasting gratitude of all free citizens of all the United Nations. So I think we can, we can let Dwight Eisenhower have the last word. Uh, I guess so. And I think He's absolutely right, and this is a great day to remember all those people involved. And this is you guys have been amazing in uh, working. Thank you so uh, much to help us remember this. Uh, uh, author Giles Milton, uh, Craig Simons, Joe Balkowski. I know you've, you've you've heard their books. You're buying their books. You're reading their books, and darn it, you should be. So, okay. thank you very much, guys. Thank really you guys. appreciate right. being here. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Thank Welcome. you. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>